Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is about elephants. And that's because elephants almost never get cancer, which is kind of surprising given that they grow really large and they live a long time, which ought to provide more opportunities for the cells to turn into cancer cells. And the reason for this is probably a newly described gene that was brought back from the dead that they think is now protecting them from disease. When scientists looked into the elephant's evolutionary history, they found a defunct gene called LIF6 that somehow got turned back on 59 million years ago when elephants started to get really big. And it's found only in elephants and their relatives. It's triggered by another gene called TP53, which puts cells out of commission at the first sign of damage before they turn cancerous. And the TP53 gene makes a protein that protects cellular DNA damage and signals for the cell to basically fix itself or die, <laughs> which is what we want our own cells to do. Elephants have 20 copies of the TP53 gene compared to just one in humans and other mammals like us. And studies where they looked at autopsy data from the San Diego Zoo in a database of 650 elephant deaths found that just about 4.8% of them get cancer. And for humans, it can go as high as 25%. What that means is that not only do I want to be part elephant because of the cancer thing, but elephants have a good memory and they live a long time. So maybe my spirit animal is the elephant, not the naked mole rat. I'm still trying to figure that one out. If you like Bulletproof Radio, I'd love it if you took about 10 seconds and went to bulletproof.com slash iTunes, which will take you straight to Apple. So you could just leave a five-star review and say, hey, Dave, I laughed about your elephant joke there. Today's show as you know, I'm mastering the art of foreshadowing very, very carefully here, might have something to do with cancer, but not just something about cancer. We're going to be talking with a nationally board certified naturopathic doctor, a fellow of the American Board of Naturopathic Oncology, and someone who also studied acupuncture and oriental medicine and is licensed in both of them. I'm talking about none other than Dr. Nasha Winters, who is the author of The Metabolic Approach to Cancer, which is a bestseller in 2017, and really one of the great books on cancer that's worth reading. Now, she's based in Durango, Colorado, and is the former CEO of Optimal Terrain Consulting, where she taught people about highly personalized integrative oncology care. And the reason I have her on the show today is that we're not just going to talk about cancer, although frankly, a large percentage of people are facing that sometime in their life, but we're going to be talking about ketones and metabolism. And funny enough, all of us have metabolisms, so this is a highly <laughs> relevant show. Uh, Dr. Nasha, welcome to the show. Thank you so much. It's a joy and honor to be here. My husband's a little bit jealous. Um, I have to say, I told him I'd give a shout out for him to you. So, <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. tell him I said hi. And okay. I, I would have come there uh, to Durango uh, in person to interview you, but I, I have PTSD around Durango. You want to um, know why? Yeah. <laughs> so, so when I was around, uh, I don't know, eight or 10 or something like that, I was sleeping in a, a log cabin by Vicedo Lake. Oh, yeah. And I woke up with a vampire bat feeding on my neck. <laughs> and I grabbed the thing, and I was on the top bunk bed, and I thought it was a mouse, because I and who would, who would think a vampire bat, they don't live here. And I went to throw it on the floor to, to kill it or something, and it bit my thumb, and when I threw the floor, it never hit the floor. And I'm like, oh. it's pitch dark, I don't know where my flashlight is, and I'm trying to wake up my sister, and... She, she didn't believe me and no one believed me. I'm like, no, there was something, it bit my neck. <laughs> and finally I, I was insistent of, we got flashlights and we caught the vampire bat and we took the vampire bat to Mercy Medical Center. You know where this is, right? Cause you were uh, right, right by my house. Yeah. <laughs> and we brought it there in a plastic pitcher from the hospital actually that, and it's just kind of flopping around a bat halfway injured. And we called every rabies expert in the country. They all said, pour ether in there so we can freeze the bat and look at its brain to see if it has rabies. So wow. we're in the ER. We pour ether into a plastic pitcher with a, a vampire bat inside it. Ether melts plastic. Oh. So what happens? You have a half-dead bat covered in plastic goo on the floor, flopping around, every nurse up on chairs screaming, <laughs> and I'm sitting there. 
with two little V marks on my neck. This actually happened. I'm the only person ever to have been bitten by a vampire bat, and it was in your hometown. (laughs) And you've not been back since, which I I don't blame you. (laughs) I I grew up backpacking in Colorado. But anyway, that's my favorite Durango story ever. Now, everyone knows, yes, I've actually been bitten by a vampire bat, and it explains so much, doesn't it? Oh, my gosh. And funny thing is this year, my cat brought us a vampire bat to the house a few weeks ago. An actual vampire bat, not a New Mexico bat? vampire bat. Oh, yeah. And then my husband kept it in a little box in our bathtub. And I kept telling him it's time to put it elsewhere. So he finally did move it into the greenhouse and it finally took off. But we have had an outbreak of rabies in bats in our community. So I'm laughing that you're having this story. Um, but yeah. Because so they're not native. PTSD is really, I know. And it was huge. I've never seen anything so big um, in, in the bat world because we're used to seeing really cute yeah. little furry, you know, like little mice with wings. Oh, no. This guy was horrific. So that that's that's you're giving me PTSD just hearing your story (laughs) (laughs) and see before we go further everyone does this it's so common but my name is with a long a Nisha I think Nisha how should I not know that Nisha I should have checked before the show every single it's even my relatives so you're normal (laughs) where is Nisha from oh my gosh named after an ex-girlfriend of my dad's before I met my mom um it's a Turkish name he was stationed in in Turkey and my mom and my dad probably never thought I would uh learn about the actual origin of my name. So uh, it's pretty funny. <laughs> I was guessing Russian. That's why I did it. But anyway, Nisha, I've got it. Thank you for telling me. Yeah, no worries. All right. Now everyone else knows how to say it right, which is great. Yeah, exactly. Now, you have an interesting uh, an interesting background in that you've studied both Western and Eastern med. Uh, and in every time I talk with someone who studied both sides, they're always better off than someone who knows one side or the other. But generally, it, isn't it sort of like the the mark of shame for a Western doctor to study acupuncture because everyone knows that's a bunch of BS, right? I mean, like, like I, what drove your decision to be one of those doctors who doesn't just wear a lab coat and, and give out drugs? Well, my, my decision to not just be one of those doctors, which is what I initially planned to do, was thanks to those doctors sort of falling far um, from, from the pedestal in my own journey of health. I was very, very sick at a very young age and Western medicine, despite my being enamored of it and wanting to study it and in pre-med for it, um, failed me. And so (laughs) I had to frankly save, one of my patients calls it save your own ass university. That's what I had to do. And the Eastern Western blend for me, because I started in that scientific realm, um, made sense to bring them both together. And I cannot imagine a life without both, both in the in the sandbox with me. It's a really common driver uh, for some of the very best healers and doctors uh, that I know who have a fully, uh, just a broad spectrum view of, of healing. Let's say I'm going to do whatever works. And if I don't know why it works, if it works reliably, I'm, I'm okay. It's usually (laughs) people who got really sick Uh, and and I see it over and over. Uh, And a lot of doctors, whether they're uh, from one tradition or another, um, if they haven't faced it themselves and had to say, oh my God, I need something, something out, something from outside the box. I I look at what you do as sort of the mixed martial art of medicine. (laughs) That's That's perfect. (laughs) Uh, I mean, it really is. Yeah. This idea of, well, I have to win because someone's going to die here if I don't win. And that someone is me. Uh, You're willing to do something. Well, that it wasn't in the karate tradition. It doesn't matter. Like you you kick the guy in the knee, whatever. Uh, So thank you for having the courage to do it. And the courage comes from, I don't want to die, which is cool. What what happened that made you so sick? Uh, Stage four ovarian cancer happened at 19. At yeah. 19. Yeah. And missed for, it was actually right around just two weeks past my 20th birthday when I got the official news um, that I was spending my entire 19th year on this planet in and out of ERs over and over and basically being pegged as that, um, you know, crazy uh, histrionic woman that, you know, was in their ER a couple times a month for months and months on end. And so by the time I filled up with, you know, eight and a half nine liters of ascites and was in end organ stage and looked like little stick arms and legs with a giant Buddha belly. Finally, someone decided they should probably do some other scanning and imaging and blood testing. Wow. So that would yeah. definitely be a failure of Western medicine. Yes. yes. Yeah. One of the things I learned when I shot Moldy, the documentary on toxic mold, 
was that in in medical school, they teach you that if a patient has more than maybe five symptoms, by definition, they're a hypochondriac because yeah. diseases don't do that. Is, is that what you were facing? Totally. And I'd show up and they just kept funneling me into this. Well, she's got to have just a little histrionic behavior. She's got to just have an STD because I had a lot of pelvic pain. You know, they just, I was the zebra, right? No one was looking for um, uh, ovarian cancer diagnosis in a 19 year old in 1991, 1990, right. I mean, just a in the last couple of months, I've seen a six-year-old and a nine-year-old with stage four ovarian cancer. Okay. So we know things have changed in the last couple of decades, but 27 years ago, that wasn't the case. So um, you're right. I just got kind of pegged as, and they always thought I was a drug seeker, despite me saying, I can't take these drugs. They make me terribly sick. (laughs) Right. And so like, that's even worse. And of course, years later, when we learned about epigenetics and I started learning about that in myself, it explained why every medication I could have ever taken or has ever have ever taken has backfired horribly. So, you know, been a living experiment ever since. The the whole drug seeking thing, it, it it's annoying. My wife is a drug and alcohol addiction emergency medicine doctor from Stockholm. She does fertility work now, but uh, yeah. She tells me these stories. Drug seeking is real, but when you have someone uh, uh, who has an actual problem, it's it's within the doctor's necessary behavior to do that. I had the same thing. I, I went to a, a psychiatrist when I was going to ward, and I'm like, my brain isn't working. Something's wrong, like really wrong. It turns out, yeah, I had mold and some other stuff, uh, no blood flow in the brain, etc. But uh, he he thought I was just oh, this guy wants Adderall for business school. God, I see these all the time. And when I walked in after he saw the lab data, he's like you have the best camouflage I've ever seen inside your brain is total chaos. I don't even know how you're talking to me. And I'm like, there, now we give me some drugs. And the drugs you gave me made me feel like crap, right? <laughs> but right. at least modafinil worked. But it's that same story. Yeah. Where like no one believes you. And you have to sort of come in almost with with your fists in a ball. Like, all right, I'm going to yeah. fight. Right. But you actually have to partner with the doctor to make anything happen. So you got to find yeah. the right doctor who's going to at least believe you. And that's huge. That's huge. And so part of the way the strategy for staying well today is having your team, right? right? Your, your, your power team of your healthcare providers. It doesn't, you should never lean on just one to help you get through this. Yeah. Having a, a collection of people you trust who know your case is important, but it's expensive and, and it's yeah. different. And when you're 19 and you're dealing with, Oh my God, something's really wrong here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You're going to do it. A lot of people don't hit that till, you know, their mid thirties, but the, right. the sooner you have a couple people you really trust who are going to keep you on this is it, going to work uh, really well. Yeah. Uh, so now you're 27 years after this big thing. Um, mm-hmm. You've written some some very uh, some powerful books about what's going on with metabolism and cancer. You actually gave a talk uh, called "Empowering the Powerhouses: Biohacking Our Mitochondria" uh, at a cancer conference. And I'm like, you you go <laughs> go, Nisha. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is important stuff because some percentage of cancer is not a genetic which we used to think it all was. And in fact, it's mitochondrial or perhaps fungal. In your clinical experience, your belief, and it's okay if you cite studies, it's okay if you say, this is what I think. Yeah. What percentage of cancer is caused by epigenetics or the environment around us or our bodies responding to it versus genetics versus some infectious thing? Oh, I love that question. I've never had it quite asked that way. Most people just say how much is genetic, right? We kind of focus there because that's where we've been hanging out for 70 years. So really the answer, and there are studies, and I won't cite them right now, but they're in our book and other places, but we actually are able to show that probably 90 to 95% of our chronic illness, which includes cancer, is epigenetic mitochondrial damage centric in nature and not actually a, 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 a genetic hiccup that is absolutely out of our control, which means that we are far more powerful than we've been led to believe. It, it is the core definition of biohacking is change the environment around you and inside of you so you have control of your biology. And yeah. what's missing from the conversation around epigenetics is that what are the, the smallest parts of the body that sense the environment first? They're mitochondria. They're not just powerhouses, right. they're sensors. Exactly. Right. And, and exactly. they're driving all these other behaviors. And I, I agree, it's got to be 90% plus uh, from everything I, I've seen. But I've had a guy on the show says, no, it's all genetic. Here's all the data. And you know, within five years, with yeah. just, just looking at our nuclear DNA, we'll be able to fix almost all cancer. Hmm. Uh, it didn't, I just didn't believe that. because. <laughs> but if you believe his assumption that cancer is genetic, then what he's saying is totally true. How do we know 
if we're looking at the right assumptions when we go about solving a problem? What's your thought process like when, when you're writing wow. a book or when you're doing that? Well, first, I think that one, one thing that came to mind when you shared the story of, of talking with this guy, um, I heard that lecture, I heard that interview, by the way. So I'm, I'm oh, intrigued, you know, because I, I, I want to hear all aspects yeah. of it. That it's, I don't ever throw everything out. It's all pieces of the data come into the sandbox with me. Um, but one of the things you started the talk off today with the elephant story. And you talked about the TP, TP53 gene, okay? This little guy is damaged in about 50% of the population, meaning it's not behaving as the best gatekeeper of our genome as it should already in 50% of us living on the planet today. That's on average. But when you add insult to injury, such as you had to take a round of Cipro, or you just took a massive amount of chemotherapy, or you just had a major mold, you know, or fungal toxic exposure, that poor gene gets even more shut down, it gets even more suppressed. So that little gatekeeper, you know, partially what that guy is saying is true, he's just looking one or two steps downstream. And yet, what we actually are starting to find is you need to back it up a few steps to realize that our DNA, our genes will not be damaged or will not be, um, ir you know, like irreversibly damaged if our mitochondria are healthy enough, vital enough, efficient enough, effective enough to protect that um, process. So, so I think that he is still uh, in that straddling that world, that's still very gene centric because it's been a 70 plus year experiment. It's hard to let go of, but ultimately we need to back it up a little bit further down to what is protecting those genes to begin with. And that comes back down to the mitochondria. Uh, well, we're, we're definitely in agreement there on this, this mitochondrial importance. And, and for me, cancer is one of the many things, but I, I couldn't find anything when I was writing Headstrong Diabetes, yeah, mitochondrial, they can't use sugar, right? Yeah. It, it's not an insulin receptor thing as much as it is. It's an energy use thing. Yeah. Uh, and you look at Alzheimer's, uh, uh, you look at heart disease, you look at Parkinson's, uh, just everything is yeah. mitochondrial. Even your response to an infectious disease, if your mitochondria work well, you're going to kick its ass. And if they don't work well, it's going to kick your ass. Exactly. And and what you said earlier, like the TP53, if that's not doing its job, it does not discern the unhealthy from the healthy cells. And when the unhealthy cells start to pick up momentum, it can't do anything about it. And so the mitochondria are, in fact, the garbage collection and removal system. They are the first line of apoptosis for any damaged cells, whether that's from an infectious nature um, and a chemical assault, a stressful um, experience. And so when you asked, how do I assess this? In all my clients, I start with kind of this questionnaire. And it, actually, the questionnaire is in the book, The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. But that's 20-some years of me figuring out that there's kind of 10 main patterns probably that folks are dealing with when um, those little mitochondria decide to go on sabbatical, right? And that includes things that go into their mitochondrial bucket of things like stress, you know, blood sugar imbalance, hormone disruption, circadian rhythm disruption, uh, chemical stressors, um, cir uh, circulation issues. So angiogenesis as well as just, are you oxygenating well? Inflammation, immune system issues, um, microbiome, ginormous. I mean, it, it's all of these facets. If you ignore any one of them, chronic illness can still keep on trucking down the road. So you have to keep looking into the garden and plucking the weeds as you go and um, amending the soil all along the way. One of the things that you uh, that you look at in your overall, uh, the way you, you deal with patients, and I, this is on your website and it's in your yeah. books and all, but you talk about ACE scores at adverse yeah. childhood yeah. events, emotional trauma as a child related to cancer. Like what kind of a, I mean, you're not wearing a burlap sack and you don't have dreadlocks. <laughs> so like, how can we have this conversation? You, you know what I mean? Like, like that's considered so hippie. Tell, walk me through the science on that because that's yeah. totally real, by the way. <laughs> it is. It is. And, and so right now you mm -hmm. could actually do a score for your experience with the bat in Durango all those years <laughs> ago as one of your adverse childhood events. But um, all kidding aside, when I started, um, after my diagnosis, I was a biology uh, chemistry ma major prepping for med school. That was my track. But after my diagnosis, I had some survival experience that made me understand that a lot of my cancer diagnosis came from a lot of trauma, 
I don't know how or why, but that was very intuitive for me because it was definitely in 1990, 1991, not talked about. Um, I wasn't in dreadlocks. I didn't have a a tinfoil hat. (laughs) You know, I was a scientist first, but like you said, I needed to save my life. So at that time, I started running across the work of people like Bruce Lipton, yeah. people like Candace Pert. This was at a time when the concept of psychoneuroimmunology was new to the stage. Like that conversation had never happened before. In fact, after my diagnosis, when I was sent to home to die, because I was too sick, they didn't even think I was well enough to take chemo or anything else. That's how shut down my organs were. Totally jaundiced the whole bit. Um, I was sent home to die. And so I went to the library and instead picked up a book called Quantum Healing by Deepak Chopra in 1991. And you got to remember, I'm a kid from Kansas originally, where evolution is not allowed to be taught in the school system for years <laughs> and years, to coming to a place where I've got this you know, Indian doctor telling me that you can make a shift, a paradigm shift in an instant. I read that book in two hours, sitting on the floor, bawling my eyes out in the library and started to explore things that he talked about in that book and stumbled across the likes of Candace Pert, um, these amazing, you know, uh, microbiologists and uh, cell molecular uh, physiologists that are out there. For people listening, Candace Pert is the woman who, who discovered the opiate receptor in the brain and just this amazing NIH uh, doctor. I didn't get to interview her. She passed away before I had a chance, oh. um, but I did interview Bruce Lipton and she's, I would call her the, the, the mother or grandmother of psychoneuroimmunology, uh, which is looking at what happens in your emotional body and how it affects actual receptors on your cells. And her own life is this sort of angry scientist evolving into, yes, I do meditation, and now everything changed. And in her book, The Molecules of Emotion, is something yeah. everyone who listens to the show mm-hmm. should read. Yeah, life-changing, life-changing. Yeah. And, and so because of her... I changed my major from psychology or from chemistry biology to psychology biology. And that became kind of at that time in the early 90s, a self-constructed psychoneuroimmunology major. Um, And I have never looked back. And so that is what drew me into the realms of Eastern medicine and philosophy. That's what drew me into the realms of psychology, psychiatric issues, um, which just caught me on fire and frankly gave me a a path to traverse through my own process. You mentioned uh, trauma and uh, pelvic pain, Mm. uh, particularly in women. And I I work a lot with functional medicine doctors and uh, people like that. And and a few of the more progressive ones who are dealing with things like endometriosis uh, and just uh, otherwise unexplained pelvic pain. Some of them, you know, off the record are saying, Dave, I think 90% plus of the time, there is a history of abuse, uh, emotional or otherwise, and uh, and that, that that's the missing gun, and that if I don't do something to either treat the patient or get them to treat it with some sort of trauma release thing, no matter what medical interventions I throw at this, the body won't let go. Yeah. Does that match yeah. your understanding of the world? Not only does it match it, it is precisely the where it came from. It is precisely what inspired me to go into the mind-body aspect of this. And it's also been my experience of working with, at this point, tens of thousands of patients over 25 years and asking that question. And I have found, I could probably count on one hand of people with a history of pelvic cancers of any kind or pelvic um, pain or, um, or some type of you know, process along sort of the lower jowl from a Chinese medicine perspective, I've only maybe found a handful that actually claim to never have had any sexual trauma. And so it really correlates very well. And to kind of come back around to the ACE score, the adverse childhood events, is just a simple questionnaire of 10 questions about particular experiences had before the age of 18 that we know changes epigenetic expression and causes things like breakdown of our TP53 function. And basically for every yes you have on that 10 questionnaire, your likelihood of having a chronic illness or cancer in adulthood goes up 20%. So just, you know, with maybe a little TMI, but I had a 10 out of 10 on my ACE bar. And, um, no wonder, like that's kind of like a giant aha. In fact, learning that about myself, because this information started being studied and put out there in the 80s 
So when I started looking for this in the 90s, I found it. And frankly, it was a life raft for me because it helped me actually feel not so traumatized to deal with the trauma. And luckily, I stumbled upon the first EMDR practitioner (laughs) right in 1991. I mean, come on, she was way ahead of her time. I mean, there's so many moments that aligned in my life an acupuncturist, a naturopathic doctor that had brand new started in this town that everyone thought were kooky, hippie, you know, folks that frankly are part of my story of health and healing. It's <laughs> awesome that you're willing, able to talk about that. And uh, what I, I've seen enough times too, where there's people say, oh, I had nothing bad happen. But I, I mean, I, I run 40 years of Zen and people do really deep uh, altered yeah. states work with neurofeedback and all. And it I've seen at least one person there yeah. and a couple of people in other similar things where they come out of this really deep meditation and go, oh my God, I just remembered I was abused for five years and it was totally missing from my consciousness. So that yeah. some of that happens. And so there's some people who, you know, they got an infection and they didn't have any trauma, but uh, the trauma removal techniques today are much stronger. If people know trauma exists, I mean, EMDR is a very powerful one for people yeah. listening who haven't heard of it. Eye movement dissociative response. <laughs> Uh, and this is the thing you do with a therapist and they move your eyes back and forth, put your brain in trauma reset mode and yeah. you can let go of stuff. But yeah. if you are 10 out of 10 on an A score, uh, you can, at least I can uh, quite often you look at someone and, and you can sort of tell if they're, if they're carrying a lot of trauma and anxiety because yeah. it, it's how you sit. It's how you, your eyes look at it's people who do that kind of work. You just, you can tell you yeah. don't really have a lot of that going on. I mean, I'm, I'm looking at you over Skype. Uh, so <laughs> you've done some, if you were a 10 out of 10, so you are a highly traumatized person through no fault of your own, right. uh, but you've done a lot of healing work that I suspect was non-medical. And you mentioned EMDR. What are the other big things that let you become who you are today? Uh, which, which also, yeah. by the way, means removing your cancer risk, but, but like, just walk right. me through the technologies you use to just cool. drop all that old crap that wasn't yours in the first place. Wow. That, that, that is interesting. And I've actually been, I've, I've touched on this in a few podcasts, um, but I've never been asked to kind of put it all in one container. So EMDR was critical. The other interesting thing, and I love that your wife works or had a history in working in addictions. I put myself through college working as a CAC drug and alcohol counselor, <laughs> right? Um, and night shift, right? So that oh, wow. should also okay. explain why it took me a little while to figure that that was a problem. Um, but interesting, in the four corners where I worked um, at that time, we sit on four Indian reservations. And at that time, it was a residential in-house drug and alcohol center as well as a psych unit. And it's so a we super have- poor part of the world with lots mm-hmm. of drug and alcohol problems. I grew up in New Mexico, so yeah. Oh, so if you know, yeah, that's yeah. right. You're right. Your neighbors. So right there. But what happened, though, is we had a lot of shamans mm-hmm. as part of the healing for these. So I would be invited to sweat lodge. I would be invited wow. to ceremony. I would be invited to things that, again, I'm from Kansas, Okay. <laughs> My grandma said, you know, my grandma, when I went to naturopathic school, said I was going into witchcraft. So (laughs) just to give an example here. So this was a very new world for me. But because it was part of my job, I was exposed to things and had experiences and saw things that were frankly not possible. Right. And part of seeing that helped me realize I didn't have to be put into a box of possibility either, that anything was possible. So that definitely informed. And then another critical piece that landed in about the same time was an experience with psilocybin cubensis. And Mushrooms. Me, exactly. And so to me, the combination of a rewiring of my brain that was critical for me to realize the types of grooves I had built with my neurochemistry were so deep and so obstructed that without something to lift me up and see what was around me, that ability to, to see the possibility of my own healing was frankly impossible. The groove was so deep with my trauma history. Um, and so those were kind of, to me, if I had to pick top three, those were it. And since then, 27 years later, I've kind of tried it all on for size. I'm fascinated by ways that we can recircuit our psychology, re-express um, our epigenetics, you know, upregulate. Wow. And so I kind of jokingly say that, you know, naturopathic doctors were the original biohackers. Um, yep. And that's why I, I was so drawn to you and your work is you were taking it from like, I'm taking it from old school nature cure, Eastern ways of being, you coming from the tech world. It's like we are finding a really cool common point. And actually the center point to me looks like we are landing on the science. 
that seems to be the intersection of a lot of these pathways. There's a lot of dogma on both sides. So there's there's the 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 ultra uh, I don't know what it's called ultra ultra hippie you know ultra you know I would never touch a pharmaceutical I would never use technology you know oh gross you know uh, keep your cell phone away from me and then there's the flip side which is well there isn't a double blind clinical yeah. trial funded by a drug company so <laughs> clearly it can't work and therefore you're a bad person yes yeah, so, so and I I came from that world actually. But but when you look at the data <laughs> from either side, you end up with this fact that sometimes drugs work. Uh, there's really good things you can do with Western medicine. Uh, but if you ignore all the soft stuff, the data shows it doesn't work. And right. and your answers are, it, I'm, thank you for the courage to just say it. Like, yeah, I did EMDR, I did <laughs> mushrooms, and I saw a shaman, and I got better. <laughs> right. And, and in my own path, let's see, what did I do? Uh, I tried all the Western stuff that didn't work. I went to Tibet, learned meditation from the masters. I did ayahuasca with a shaman in Peru. I did a lot of holotropic breathing and mm -hmm. I did a lot of neurofeedback and yeah. got to where I am today, uh, also by removing old traumatic patterns. And and I see CEOs, they come through uh, the 40 years in stuff. There's no one without traumatic patterns. Um, that that are affecting how they treat other people today that they're entirely unaware of. And some of right. them have a lot, some of them have a little, but it, it seems like these are things, they're not infections, but they're they're right. things that are not working well in your in your software instead of in your hardware. Right. And when you fix those, the hardware works better. Uh, yeah. Do you agree? Oh my gosh, Be uh, so beautifully said. Okay. And, and I think that you're spot on that we all carry some degree of an imprint of some trauma of just you know, like the bat and Viacito, you know, we kind of joke about that, but you're probably a little flinchy in mountain cabins, you know. I, I, actually, I actually got over time. that. I, <laughs> okay, I, I've, yeah. I've been to the bat caves in okay. uh, in southern New Mexico there, and, and yeah, I, I don't have a thing about bats, but I, <laughs> I had my own set of things from being bullied and even traumatic birth. I mean, you've delivered 36 uh, babies. Yeah, I've only yeah. delivered two, mm -hmm. but I had a, they were mine, but um, uh you know, I mean, I had birth trauma. That was a core part of the way, you know, I, I don't think like, you know, the world's a dangerous place. I didn't believe that necessarily, but my nervous system did. So until you get over that crap, you're probably going to act like a jerk. And, and, <laughs> <laughs> and it will just, it keeps putting you into same patterns over and over again. And when someone keeps saying, when I hear a patient or frankly myself say, why does this thing keep happening to me? Or why do I keep ending up with the same type of friendship, relationship, job situation, yada, 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 that's when you have to look inward um, because the common denominator of that is you. And that's hard. That's a very, that is the most difficult. That's why the last chapter of our book is on the psychology side of it because it is often the hardest and scariest Everest to hike of all the things. People love to do the tangible, measure out their food macros and check their blood ketones and, you know, even take their little questionnaires and they love that but when we start to talk about crawling into the muck of it that's not so easy that, that's why for me neurofeedback worked really well because you have a data-driven lie detector you're like oh <laughs> i guess i can't hide from that because you know the, the the sounds get quieter so then you know it it forced me to uh you know face every inner demon and at this point like if i have any of that stuff i'm like I'm wiring myself up. I'm going to go in there and knock that out. So I don't want to. I don't want to have unconscious reactions to the world, uh, just because. Why would you do that? Uh, but you you mentioned something pretty powerful in there, and something that I'm a huge fan of and an, an early supporter of, and that's ketosis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I have noticed that when I have ketones present, even just low level ones, my ability to meditate to do healing work on myself is much better. Um, so that's emotional healing work. But you're talking about uh, in your book, especially how ketones are just fundamental to cancer. So let's shift gears a bit. So we know cool. emotional trauma matters and, yeah. and ketones also matter. Tell me about ketones, uh, why you think they work for cancer, how you use them, and uh, just what's your approach? So, you know, I think when we start talking about, so a, a little backtrack again, in 1990, 1991, there was no Dr. Google. In fact, I worked in a library yeah. on work study. There was the Dewey Decimal System. I That's remember I it well. Okay. And in my small, uh, you know, liberal arts school, we did not have a fancy library. So we kind of got all the defects. So what I had access to were very old textbooks. And in those old textbooks, while I was leafing through what is cancer and what the heck do I do about this, because no one else was going to save me, I stumbled across the work of Otto Warburg. 
Oh, nice. And thank you for not having modern technology so I could look at something from the 1920s that had gone out of favor after Watson and Crick got cranking with their um, you know, double helix. So um, that being said, as I started to understand that I could manipulate the engine of my body with the fuel sources that I provided it, whether it was fasting, which was an old nature cure approach, which I was, I was also free because that was starving, you know, yeah. medical student or uh, undergrad student. So that was a really good way to approach it. At that time, the only information out there available to cancer was Gerson, um, mm-hmm. you know, as far as kind of a raw food vegan. But when you actually look at the father Gerson approach to modern Gerson today, they are very different animals. And if we want to cover that later, we can come back oh, yeah. to that. But ultimately, um, that was this place I started adopting within myself. I started bringing on fasting very early on, um, and it made the biggest difference of any tool that I threw at my cancering process. It stabilized things immediately um, in my own body. So let's Fast forward all these years later. That I saw you did I, there. Fast forward. That, that was <laughs> oh, <Sorry. laughs> so oh, my, I went to medical school in 1996 and decided that cancer would never be part of my practice or part of my experience. I was wanting it out of my life as much as possible. And I didn't even tell. In fact, I there. It's only been the last couple of years I really shared my story because of the reaction I get from doing it the way I did it. But that being um, said, my first week in private practice, a gentleman comes in in a wheelchair, unable to walk, unable to talk, in excruciating pain, sent to me for pain management with acupuncture, okay? And um, I realized right away that his parietal lobe is bulging out, and it becomes very clear to me what I'm actually dealing with. And he had been um, diagnosed with a terminal brain tumor, was given days to weeks to live because his ventricles had closed down in his, on his CT scan. So I thought I was just doing end-of-life supportive care. Now, he was seizing unbelievably, right? Nothing was touching it. He was on every pharmaceutical you could imagine. And the only thing I knew to do, per the literature, even though I'd had my own experience with this, was a ketogenic diet. Mm-hmm. And this gentleman lived 18 more months on a ketogenic diet, basically me pulling it out of my ass in 2000, 2001, <laughs> because there was no Miriam Kalanians or Thomas Seagrades or Travis Christofferson's in the world to guide us on this. Um, I was petrified, you know, that I was going, but there was nothing else. I was end of life care. So I thought, well, if anything, one of the things I was reading about ketones was its anti-inflammatory property. Right. And his brain was clearly inflamed. So this man within weeks, within two weeks, was out of diapers, out of a wheelchair, able to talk, able to have quality of life. In fact, the weekend before he died, he was up in the high country looking at the fall colors of his family, and he died peacefully in his bed with his three little kids and his wife next to him. Just a whole different experience than the excruciating exit he was initially taking before we met. And so the universe had a very different idea for what, how I was supposed to work with patients and cancer in particular, which at that time I knew if I said I'm putting people on ketogenic diets, I would get stopped before I got started. Oh, yeah. I'm a naturopath. I'm in an unlicensed state. Ketogenic <laughs> diet still today is very controversial. So all I did was talk about I put people on low-carb diets, right? Yep. And that was the safety mechanism of what we called it. And that even then, everyone thought it was batshit crazy saying things like low carb diet, you know, oh, sugar has nothing to do with cancer. We still weirdly hear that despite the mountains of evidence speaking up to that otherwise. That's, that's just crazy pants at this point. Like someone who says that's like, do you read? <laughs> exactly. Like I, maybe remove head from butt to take a look. <laughs> it drives me crazy. Um, but, but ultimately that has been kind of the foundation of the work that I've done. And what I witnessed long before Travis and Thomas and Dom Dagestine, and all these guys came to the table was that this had an impact on many mechanisms, not just mm-hmm. lowering sugar to starve cancer. In fact, that seems to me like the bottom of the ladder. And, and cancer can eat ketones too. Well, at least in, at least in laboratory, yeah. you know, in cell lines, we don't yeah. really see that in humans. I will, I do fight that one a little bit because I've been doing this for so long. There's a lot of BRAF patients, a lot of colorectal patients, a lot of prostate patients, breast cancer patients that I keep hearing out there saying, oh, it's not good for these patients. I'm like, then you should talk to the hundreds well, the, of mine that are still kicking on the it. The <laughs> anti-inflammatory stuff trumps that effect. It's not like you need to starve the cancer. You need to turn the metabolism on and ketones will do that. So I, I'm with you it. there. 
it's just this little uh, change in the in the pedal to the metal on this. So ultimately, what has happened is people like Dr. Adrian Sheck's work are are able to now show that ketones impact all ten of the ten hallmarks of cancer. Walk we me through the ten hallmarks. Okay. Well, forgive me while I pull out my book because my brain does it to my patient population in a very uh, basic conversation. I, about I, I get it. I pull my book Thank out you. too because there, so. there's, it, it takes thousands of hours to write a book and it doesn't you memorize every hour. At, at I get least. it. And for me, it took two decades. So, yeah. there. <laughs> so um, number one, sustained uh, proliferation of cells. Hello. There was that TP53 conversation we had in the beginning. You don't have something to turn that off. So one of the things we've noticed is that ketones upregulate TP53 activity in the way we want it to. Number two, insensitivity to anti-growth signals. So, you know, they become like little rogue, uh, you know, like uh, toddlers who just ignore anybody telling them to put their shoes on, right? They just ignore you, forget any signals coming their way, and they just do their own thing. That's a hallmark. Another hallmark is the evasion of apoptosis. Now that comes directly down to the mitochondria. The mitochondria are in charge of apoptosis. Which is basically programmed cell death of cells that are that are bad for people who don't know the medical term. Exactly. Yeah. And then limitless replicative potential. Now we all have this sort of inner, you know, you should be able to re, re like recycle this particular cell a certain number of times before it gets worn out and dies and moves on. But with cancer cells, it doesn't do that. So they recycle, but they get weaker and weaker and more rogue and more mutated and more difficult to kill and more difficult to see um, across the board. So that's another one. Sustained angiogenesis. So one of the coolest things we've learned about ketogenic diets is that it seems to cut off that vascular blood supply to the tumor. Again, another challenge we have in conventional oncology. Um, we have about 26 different mechanisms of angiogenesis, and we have one or two drugs that we throw at it. And ironically, it's like a whack-a-mole game. So we might shut off one, but frankly, we wake up the other 25 sleeping tigers. Don't, don't you actually want angiogenesis for longevity? Thank you. That's the that's the trick here is that- Hold, hold on. I, I'm just going to take a little bit of oral nicotine. <laughs> Of. <laughs> which drives angiogenesis, which is good for you unless you have cancer, in which case maybe you ought not to use it. Anyway, sorry, I'll get off my nicotine no, horse no, there. No, but you get on that <laughs> nicotine horse because the body is wise to say, these cells over here need it, these cells over here don't. Yeah. But when we bring pharmaceuticals sometimes into the mix, we try and completely turn on or off a switch, and yet we are these complex, dynamic beings that sometimes we need to heal a wound, and sometimes we need to let the wound know that it's healed and done. So that's a biggie that keto kind of gives the smart bomb of you need to stay, you need to go in yeah. the process. And then a couple of others, the ability to metastasize, that's all, that's a biggie because once we get to the metastatic world, it's really challenging to drive this process back. Once we hit a stage three or four in Western medicine, you've got an average of anywhere from five to 12% are still here across the board cancer types in five years. I like to overcome those statistics. I'm working with a guy who... In, in most of the people he's worked with can turn off all metastases within two weeks. Oh, I like and, and, he's, I, and he's he has patents of drugs in his names and he's terrified to put this stuff out in the world. I'm sure he is. I'm sure he is because <laughs> we're not, I mean, even when we see the power of ketones on this, people get attacked and, you know, yeah. ridiculed. And not to ever say, I mean, while we still have a couple more to go on this list, yeah. the ketones by themselves are the trick. They make the cancer cells and the cancer process vulnerable so that other therapies, yes. it, it's, the, it's the Trojan horse. And so it carries radiation to its target. It carries um, aromatase inhibitors to its target or PARP inhibitors. It carries um, certain chemotherapeutic agents to its desired target with better cell death and better support of the healthy cells and marrow to keep the terrain vital so that you don't take it all out with the napalm of the cancer treatment. Yeah. So uh, beautiful. Yeah. All right, keep, <laughs> so keep, keep going on your list. This, this is golden. <laughs> cool. Cool. And then this is the one that everyone thinks ketones are all about is just the reprogramming of energy metabolism. That is one of the 10 hallmarks of cancer. And it's a biggie, 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 but we're all super hyper focused on that alone. And on that alone as being the reason why ketones work or the reason why ketones could potentially be used as fuel. For cancer. If you just simply ignore that one, the fact that it touches all other nine is pretty compelling. And so avoidance of immune destruction, 
and immune detection, um, which is huge because cancer starts to cloak itself from the immune system and hide and basically evade the immune system and evade, um, you know, natural killer cell and dendritic T cell activity. It just can kind of wonder woman bracelet it off. And we need that to be vulnerable to our immune system, which is actually what treats the cancer, not the cytotoxic agent that we might be putting into the mix. So people might get beautiful cytotoxic reduction, but ultimately if the immune system is not up and running, the cancer will be back bigger and louder than ever after the process. And then tumor promoting inflammation. We kind of hit off the conversation around my very first experience, both personally, because I had massive angiogenesis and massive inflammation with ascites. That's all ascites is, is inflammation and um, angiogenesis. So that really helped me by fasting. I, I cut off supply chains to that. Same with this gentleman with the parietal lobe bulging out when he came into the uh, clinic in a wheelchair. We quieted that inflammatory fire very, very quickly and very powerfully and sustainably. And then finally, genome stability and mutation. This circles all the way back to the beginning of our conversation. We now understand ketones to be HDAC inhibitors, to be epigenome express, like help, help our epigenetics express better and um, avoid expression where they're broken, if that makes sense. That's kind of put weird. Maybe you can help me reframe that. But ultimately, it has a direct impact impact on our epigenetic expression. Uh, that is uh, an epic list of 10 things. And if, if you're listening to this right now. You can see why you might want to read a metabolic approach to cancer if uh, if you're dealing with it in your family. And this reminds me of something. In the, the very early days of, of Bulletproof, uh, I had a guy reach out and I had uh, coffee with him at the Rosewood Hotel on uh, Sand Hill Parkway. This is where all the big VCs are. Mm-hmm. This guy was, uh, just to pro- for confidence uh, or, or confidentiality, yeah. um, he was a C-level officer of a Fortune 400 company. Uh, and he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, mm-hmm. the same stuff that killed Steve Jobs. Uh, thank you low fat, high carb diet. Uh, Can I just say that? Right. Uh, uh, mono, mono apple fast and mono carrot fast. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah. that doesn't work very well. So we, yeah. we lost a great, a great one that way. Yeah. Um, but so this is a, a very dangerous cancer mm-hmm. and it was too big to be operable. So I, I'm talking to this guy and he was very well read. He'd found my little blog at the time. And he said, Dave, I just want to tell you what happened. He said, the day I got the diagnosis, I didn't tell my family. I don't want my kids to worry. I didn't want my board of directors to worry. <laughs> so I went full keto. I didn't eat any carbs again. Uh, I did that for nine months and I went in to do chemo uh, to shrink the tumor so it could be operable. And when I did chemo, I was in ketosis the entire time, and they wouldn't do insulin potentiated therapy, which is when you inject insulin with chemo to drive it into the cancer cells further. He said, so I just told the oncologist, look away, and I shot insulin into myself to do it. <laughs> oh, my God. And in nine months, he shrunk the cancer by two-thirds, so it was operable. He went in for an elective procedure, had it removed, never told his family, never told anyone, but he completely saved his own life in a year from something that was a sure death, painful diagnosis. And talk about, uh, I think the technical term for that is talk about balls. <laughs> I mean, like, exactly. uh, you know, he was like, I, I am not going down like this. And he just did everything right because the knowledge was out there. This was probably eight years ago. The knowledge was there and it's way more out there now than it was a little while ago. And it's, I, I found your book to be pretty uh, amazing because you got all this stuff in there, uh, including the dealing with old trauma patterns, right? Yeah. Uh, so thank you for for you know looking at it the way you have, mm-hmm. and I've seen this work uh, in in people where you know the if you listen to what your your chemo only guy is going to tell you is is basically you're you're screwed you know right up your will, um, and it's it's not necessary anymore, and and you may die of cancer it still happens, but you also he used chemo. And you use chemo. And there's so many people out there, well, if I had cancer, I would just eat, you know, I would do Garrison therapy or I would just go in ketosis and, you know, hope for the best. Uh, what do you say to people like that? I don't know the answer, but I want to hear you say it. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually, I didn't use chemo. And so I freak people out. This is actually why I don't tell my, or why I never really told my story while I was in medical practice in a brick and mortar practice is because 
as a naturopathic doctor, I'm already scrutinized as it is. And everybody thinks they're, cu- they're going to come to me and I'm going to tell them no way to conventional therapies and everyone raw food, you know, raw juice, vegan, right? That's right. what people assume I'm going to do until they sit down with me and realize I'm a scientist first. I'm a woo woo nature doc second. Um, I believe they both co actually, I think they're parallel. I think they yeah. let, let stay on the same plane exactly. And I look at the patient. I treat the patient and their patterns. I never treat cancer or cancer tumors. I treat the terrain imbalances. And that is what those 10 chapters are on, are these each of those 10 patterns. So my process 27 years later, still with a tumor in my right ovary, still with lesions on my liver, still with peritoneal implants and carcinomatosis, still dealing with um, lovely edema when I fly from lymphatic lymphedema, from all that pressure build up from you know, years that ascites really blew out my core um, uh, things. But your vibe plate, which I'm standing on, by no, the way. Are you really standing on the bulletproof vibe? <laughs> I'm telling you, like I said, I stand on between clients because my edema will get terrible um, all day long. But that has been one of the hugest changes in my lymphedema was that purchase. Oh my <laughs> so goodness. A little, plug, well, a little plug for you. <laughs> thank you. Well, I mean, vibrating your whole body is going to move lymph. You just know it exactly. is, right? Exactly. My poor little vessels were so damaged from all that pressure for so long that they just never quite got their own groove. And that, as I've gotten older and stand a lot and travel a lot, they got weak weaker and my edema has gotten worse as lymphedema will do. And I introduced your plate a few years ago and it made, uh, it's like a miracle. Um, <laughs> of, of yeah, it's a pretty cool thing here, but ultimately I had to be very careful about sharing my story. Yeah. Interesting yeah. for years. The most of the people who came to see me were just saying, I want you to enhance my conventional therapy. Now the, t- the pendulum is starting to move where most people are coming to me saying, I don't want to do any conventional therapy. And you're going to find for me that I'm likely somewhere in between because I don't tell you, oh, this is your cancer and this is how you treat it. I say, let's look at the burden. Let's look at the whole terrain and let's see what is absolutely specific to you from your epigenetics, from your genomics, from your tissue assay, from your blood levels, from your current state of well-being, from the other co-factors, co-infections, co-traumas, et cetera, that you're dealing with, because sometimes we might need a bigger piece of equipment to push this back, right? And um, sometimes you don't have to be that aggressive depending on the situation. And so we don't have to guess anymore, Dave. And I think that's one of the coolest things you mentioned a moment ago. We've come to a time that I think it's irresponsible, negligent, and frankly, malpractice if people are not being offered an integrative approach to their cancer. We know too much to know that we can absolutely enhance the effect of conventional interventions or even decide precisely what conventional intervention is warranted for that person at any given time. And we can absolutely overcome um, the horrible statistic of 70% of cancer patients that have had cancer will have a recurrence. That's atrocious. And I won't play that game. So I am committed as I am on my own 27 years out. I'm still always looking under the hood. I'm still exploring what works, what doesn't work for me um, and still tweaking my metabolic fuel, if you will, constantly and helping my patients learn about that for themselves and help them adjust accordingly for hopefully decades to come. It, it's beautiful to hear you say that. And, and there's this inconvenient thing called the standard of care. <laughs> and, and so the, the, there are many doctors, especially oncologists out there who would like to be doing some way you're doing, but they're terrified that they're going to lose their livelihood because, oh, the standard of care is in ketosis. So if I do this, I'm putting you know my family's you know, food at risk. Kind of, do you see changes in the standard of care? This is what you know insurance companies say doctors are allowed to do. Basically, is yeah. that going to get fixed, or are we all just going to be like, I'm sorry, I only go there if I broke my arm. I just pay out of pocket for all the good stuff. Well, that's my life, which you just described right there. But <laughs> but ultimately, you know. Two, three years ago, I would have said we're effed. We're, we're, there's no chance it's ever going to change. It's hopeless. You know, I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. People will eventually find me or colleagues like me, and we'll just quietly keep doing what we're doing. But there's been a change. And it's thanks, frankly, to people like you, Dave, because it wasn't doctors changing it. It was the tech world changing it because people like metrics. They like to measure things. They like to quantify things. That's how I've always done it for myself. And that's why my patients loved it because they had instant feedback of what I'm doing is right on par or not and adjust accordingly. So now that metrics are kind of the hot thing, you know, um, and epigenetics is the hot thing and precision medicine initiative is the hot thing. 
Now the conversation is such that I have conventional entities, big, huge academic universities and well-known oncologists and oncology researchers coming to me to say, can we measure what you're doing? Right. I go to conferences now where like I just was at Low Carb USA and 50% of the audience this year were doctors and a handful of them. There was an NIH doctor there. There was a radio oncologist there who I met last year and she's on fire and changing the climate in her Chicago hospital oncology ward. Right. And more and more like that. We keep finding each other now. So in the last two or three years, there's been an explosion of even our conventional um, docs are starting to see that this doesn't have to be an either or. It can be a powerful and, and that even if you can't do the do beyond standard of care yourself, you certainly want to partner with someone who can round out the whole team approach. Uh, I interviewed in the last six months, a guy named Dr. Chris Smith, who's a neurosurgeon and a cancer doctor who said, well, I, I just started using <laughs> ketosis just in the last year. I'm new to this, but the, the results, my patients are insane. And, and I wanted to find someone who uh, who was very Western and just said, you know, I opened my eyes up this way and, and it didn't take him 10 years of practice. He said, well, yeah. I want people to get better. And so mm-hmm. maybe I have to be more experimental. Uh, and, and there's, it, it doesn't take much to establish a tipping point of disruption where you see enough of these traditional people do it. And all of a sudden yeah. you, if you then apply the 1960s standard of care stuff <laughs> to, a third of the cancer doctors doing it, there aren't enough cancer doctors. And, and at that point, the industry yeah. will be forced to change. Uh, and, yeah. and that's why this interview is really important because hundreds of thousands of people are going to hear this and there are a great number of doctors who listen. Yeah. And maybe they'll pick up one little tidbit that wasn't chemo and say, I'll just add you know, a little EMDR sure. to my practice yeah. uh, or refer out. And, and that's how change happens. I just feel like the internet, podcasts, social media, it's not possible to take two entire generations for something to come out like Warburg's work. Um, exactly. It's been resurrected and it's taken five to 10 years for people to be able to say, at least know who he is. Totally. Exactly. Like not resurrected, but also built upon, you know, he took it down the road as far as he can. And now this generation is grabbing the baton and taking it further and going deeper. We've learned so much even since his time. And I'm hopeful that in my lifetime, I'm going to see a whole nother iteration of this. And it is the folks like this oncologist I met in Chicago, who's also become a friend and her experience where, you know, they really were like, you're not allowed the RDs kind of all ganged up on her at the hospital. And now they're having her write protocols because it's simple. Like you can't have it both ways. You cannot both tell the patient that diet doesn't matter. So eat whatever you Mm -hmm. want. And then tell patients, don't do keto diet because it's dangerous or doesn't work. So that's this weird schizophrenic place that we're hanging out in right okay. now. That's the wave we're on. So that, I think, is where we are starting to get to the tipping point, as you described, that now people are saying, well, if it doesn't matter, then I'm just going to try maybe just to take even some exogenous ketones right. 20 minutes before my radiation therapy and see if I can not puke my guts out for the next few days, right? Simple. That, things like that, that alone is a is a benefit but you said only one more iteration of this stuff in your lifetime and i gotta oh. ask are you <laughs> expecting to die soon oh god well see that's the thing is i think my brain is still ingrained in thinking that it takes two generations yeah. to change this so thank you let's reframe that because it is happening exponentially now so maybe i'll get a see yes. 10 or 12 more <laughs> yeah, that's actually what's going to happen and everyone no, listening I- needs to know that the, the cool. speed of change, it, it, it is exponential right now. And when you look backwards, like, wow, that's, that curve is kind of flat. And you look forward, it's kind of flat, but it's pointing up. So yeah, we are going to see <laughs> massive quantum shifts in all of this stuff just in the next five to 10 years. Yeah. Uh, and that's why when I say I'm going to live to at least 180, I don't think I'm being, I think I'm being conservative. That's why there's an at least in there because I know we can do 120 with, without any of the cool tech that's already exactly. t- happening. And, right. And now I've got to ask you this. Have you done stem cells on yourself yet? So I have not, but I have one of my friends is a pretty famous stem cell doctor down in Mexico, and he teaches all over the world and um, uh, has done some pretty amazing things. So he's definitely talked to me about it, but I've always been a little bit nervous with a cancer history, cancer mm-hmm. diagnosis. And so the the research has not really been done. I mean, maybe you know, uh, but I keep looking into it and I'm not seeing anything that compels me to feel safe to do it for myself or a cancer patient. However, I have seen 
miracles with patients with MS, ALS, Parkinson's, lots of brain trauma, TBI issues, wounds, injuries. I mean, I definitely know there is an absolute, absolute Mm -hmm. place for it. And in my mind, there's got to be some way that we can manipulate our cancer stem cells with this. But I'm a little nervous to try that one on myself because things are going so well. <laughs> I, I can understand that. And I mean, I, I've done uh, an enormous number of stem cells uh, yeah. from a variety of different things, probably because I'm a human guinea pig. Also, this whole 180 <laughs> thing takes work. But one of, one of the things that's really promising for cancer patients is natural killer cells. And it's I've had perfect. my blood taken out. I've had my natural killer cells, cells canc- uh, or, uh, cultured for uh, almost two months and then all injected at once. Uh, which I did because I want a young person's immune system. And I have a huge history of toxic mold exposure, obesity, okay. autoimmunity, all sorts of crap. And you know, it, it seems to work. And that is cool. actually an anti-cancer thing. But totally. given what you've got going on, you need to get stem cells to heal all the crap the cancer did to you, right? Okay. Well, well, that's why I use mistletoe. I was, that was my next question. You told me, you know I, mean? I was like, yeah. tell, 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 me, <laughs> tell me about mistletoe. You got that mind reading thing turned on. I, I so, it's, it's, it's always been yeah, like Mistletoe is one of those things I, I've been looking into it for years. People keep sending me stuff on it, uh, but I haven't actually tried mistletoe. So why the heck, other than to get kissed, would people want to use mistletoe? <laughs> So anthroposophical medicine, which was built on the philosophy by Rudolf Steiner in the early 1900s, um, was this concept of sort of looking at the world around you in deep observation and starting to see how the outside world reflected to the inside. I'm being incredibly clips notes on this. There's a heck of a lot more to it than that. But one of the early observations that Rudolf Steiner made was the concept of the law of signatures, which is he had observed a tree in nature that had this big ball kind of centered into it. And he looked at it for a while and said, that kind of looks like a tumor. So I'm wondering if that could treat a tumor. Now that's how things from Ayurveda, that's how we learn from the Veda. That's you know, how shamans work too, right? Totally. And then down from the uh, Chinese medicine herbalists and then down into the new, you know, the eclectics into the, you know, hundreds of years ago, it's worked that way. But he somehow, I mean, the guy had to have like channeled or something because somehow he knew to take some of the extraction of the leaves that only bloom a couple of leaves in the summer and a few of the berries that only fruit in the winter, unlike any other plant in the animal kingdom, also a clue, as well as none of their branches or roots ever touch the ground. And they all grow inward and they're out of sync with the season. So it kind of sounds a little bit like the hallmarks of cancer, right, that we now know of today. So he somehow knew to take a little bit of those, put them basically in a centrifuge and whirl them, then create a, an extract and then inject it. This started happening in 1917 with the work of a, an oncologist, Dr. Ida Wegman of that time. And now a hundred years later, it is the most studied integrative oncology therapy in the world. There's over 2,500 studies, over 250 that we would call good per Western medical standards. Uh, there's a clinical trial that I helped get the IRB going and still consult on a lot at Hopkins that started in February, 2017. We are, knock on wood, looking at four more starting in this country within the next six, um, 16 to 18 months. Um, and it has one of the most profound ways to stimulate a low-grade fever. Um, so it has ways to stimulate natural killer cells, natural T-cells, you know, dendritic cells. But the other biggest piece, and this is where it gets a little woo-woo, it's where you bring the science to the woo-woo, is that it resets the rhythm. And what I believe is happening, and one of the things, this really, I promise you, it all comes together. You talked about the ACE scores. We talked about trauma. We talked about people with extreme trauma have down-regulated opiate systems. So we know in people with trauma and people with a lot of chronic illness, they tend to have down-regulated endocannabinoid and endorphin systems. What I believe is happening and where I'm getting some really cool, groovy immunology interest around the world to do some research is that I believe the mistletoe is upregulating both endorphin and endocannabinoid system. So it is resetting and restoring the rhythm. So, so yeah. you, you realize with that sentence, there's probably about 5,000 young, happy <laughs> CBD oil entrepreneurs listening to the show right now, and they're all thinking about mis- mixing mistletoe with CBD oil. So look what you just did, Nisha. Oh, uh, golly. Well, you can, <laughs> luckily, you can't mix this little guy. The lectins are so vulnerable, it can only be injected. Ah. Uh. If there's anything else because it gets easily degraded if we take it orally or if we mix it even with an IV bag of 
certain nutrients. Oh, so even liposomes won't work for it. Bummer. So see, good. I just cut that off at the pass. <laughs> good. No, it's, it's uh, making stuff that doesn't work and thinking it works um, is is actually not good for people. Exactly. Um, there's, we talked about Steiner and, and there's, my kids are in a Waldorf school, which oh, comes cool. from his philosophy. Yeah. And here's the deal that Steiner, a lot of people don't know about, or Steiner, if, if you pronounce it <laughs> properly. Um, he since he was a little kid would like see glowing things and he saw stuff most oh. people don't see and he never told anyone until he was like 40 or something he's like well i know the world works this way because i've always seen it but i was afraid to tell you guys because you wouldn't <laughs> believe me anyway so it, people could say oh great you know you got a crazy person except that the people i know who've done very advanced meditation practice the, the shamans uh and even certain people who don't have any training they have brains that can see stuff that most of us can't see and I know what those brain waves look like mm. on an EEG signal. Cool. Their brains are different and they can see different things. Cool. And we know birds and bugs can see colors we don't see. And we can measure all these fields we didn't know existed a while ago. So I'm just willing to say maybe he's crazy pants, but uh, this stuff <laughs> seems to work. And I'm happy to do crazy pants stuff that works. All I care about is did it work. And and if it's all placebo, uh, okay, fine, but I don't think that's what's going on. So um, that was maybe why he could do this because when he looks at a tree, he probably sees like hexagons and, and elves. I have no idea what he saw, but <laughs> whatever it was, he got some data, right? And then he tested yeah. it, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I love it because that is where, I mean, frankly, that's where, I mean, you have to even think about chemotherapy, for instance. It comes originally from plant medicines, so yeah. like the Pacific yew tree coming from Taxol. And, you know, like those are just examples that some of our most toxic plants in nature, when you kind of repurpose them, you can then make them some of the most potent and powerful medicines. Same idea with the concept of repurposing drugs today. And the other medication that from somebody with a trauma history and a lot of the medical history that I had that helped upregulate that we know works in upregulating endorphin system is low dose naltrexone. Mm -hmm. And so this is what's interesting is we see that LDN and mistletoe have very similar personalities in the body and in the behavior. And when you even put them together, there's an even bigger synergy. And so I'm excited about the, the future of the type of research we can do with um, repurposed medications along with this or things like psilocybin or microdosing with these medications or the concept of, you know, um, many, you know, just fasting with these processes because we've been using mistletoe as an adjuvant for 100 years with conventional chemotherapy with zero negative interactions um, as an adjunct. You know, 85% of Germans and 65% of the rest of the EU will at some point likely be placed on mistletoe before, during, and after their diagnosis and treatment or long-term prevention and maintenance program simply because that's been used there readily for 100 years. That is, uh, that is so cool, yet we don't hear about it much here in the U.S., uh, and it would probably save money and improve patient Huge. lives. So yeah. Uh, yeah. that's okay. We just heard about it in the U.S. now. <laughs> yeah. well, that, you'll hear about it much more by the end of the year. We have a book coming out, 17 authors from seven countries sharing their experience with mistletoe, everything from to intratumoral to intraperitoneal injections to doctors completely reversing Chernobyl thyroid cancer and do, you know, right into the thyroid gland to doctors using it for Lyme disease, for hepatitis C eradication in Sao Paulo, the biggest hospital in South America, um, in Brazil, using this um, to treat pediatric cancer cases and um, hepatitis C. Um, it's, amazing and global and we are so far behind here so we're excited to bring some fresh voices to the table soon does mistletoe work intravenously that's what we have some of the biggest impact on ag aggressive cancers and aggressive lyme conditions should i just use it once a year in my quest to live to 180 just prophylactically you just freaked me out that is exactly how they're starting to use it and do studies on it as kind of a vaccine a longevity quality of life anti-cancer vaccine well hook, hook me up where'd i get some <laughs> We will hook you up. <laughs> <laughs> nice. I love it. I'm going to Burning Man next week. And oh, uh, I, I don't think it's illegal to go, hey, man, you got any mistletoe? You know, so I, <laughs> hook I, you up there. <laughs> one of my colleagues, he's actually one of the head medics there who has trained in mistletoe with me. So we, I might have you two talk. <laughs> uh, I, that, that'll be awesome. I have no idea if I'll be dressed as a unicorn or not, but it'll well, be fun. fun. I'm not you really going to. You are a unicorn. Oh, thanks. <laughs> uh, on that note, Nisha, I got one more question for you. Sure. 
if someone came to you tomorrow, and so like based on everything you know, and as a human being, you know, as a medical professional, whatever, whatever you've experienced, uh, I want your advice. What it, what I want to perform better at everything I do as a human being. What are your three most important pieces of advice? What would you offer? Mm. So I'm kind of simple, and I've been asked this, and my my rote comment to this would have been historically to find your joy, find your life purpose, and find what you are, you know, express what you are grateful for. But I kind of clump those in one these days because they happen for me simultaneously. And most people who practice any one of those find that. The other thing that I think is really critical to our very survival on this planet is to get outside, get off the grid and lay on the ground or swim in the ocean or stare off into the stars because the average American today spends less than 15 minutes a day outside. And we are so disconnected from the rhythm of the nature around us that we are, it's no wonder the cell signaling has gone wonkers, right? So our circadian rhythms are upside down and inside out. And of course, even looking at you, look, I've got my little blue lenses through this, but you know, we are very much, we can still use the power of our technologies, but we have to enhance our response to them. And I believe that that's people like you, Dave, who helps teach us how to use our technology wisely. So those are kind of my three biggies, circadian rhythm reset by getting outside, finding your joy, purpose, and gratitude, and knowing how to take us to that 180-year place responsibly and um, ethically as well as in the best health possible. Uh, Beautiful, uh, wonderful answer. And thanks for just coming out there and just laying out all 10 of those pieces in your book uh, because it's it's much easier to pick one and say, oh, let's just look at this one thing. But but we know our bodies are systems. We know that if if you have a problem with the body, it's a systems problem. And to modify a system, fixing one thing usually doesn't quite fix it. You might have to do three things at once. So I, I very much respect the, the work that you're doing and the book that you wrote, uh, which is called The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. And thanks for being on the show today. Thanks so much. What an absolute joy. If you like today's show, you know what to do. Head on over to your favorite place to buy books and pick up a copy of The Metabolic Approach to Cancer because you'll learn something about what's going on in your mitochondria even if you don't have cancer and it's not something that uh, is a part of your life. Uh, Most of us at this point know people who have cancer. It is an endemic problem and it doesn't have to be the way it is now. There are so many things that are affordable much more affordable than traditional cancer treatment that improve quality of life at a minimum, probably will make you uh, live longer or maybe even just get rid of the cancer altogether, which would be the goal. Uh, So this is a a seminal work uh, in the field. You should read it and it's approachable as well. It's not too sciencey, but it it tells you what's really going on. And if you really like this episode, you could also go to bulletproof.com slash iTunes and leave a review or leave a review for a Bulletproof product on Amazon. I look at reviews because they tell me whether what I'm doing is useful for you. So give me five stars if it deserves five stars. Thank you.